So, Luanne, did you have a question? I just had one other comment. I learned yesterday in talking to Julia that Art's 80th birthday is tomorrow. Oh, so Art and I have a birthday year next to each other. I'm the ninth, he's the 10th. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> <laughs> and you and you and you. So do you want to mute All right, everybody? All right, so I'm going to mute everybody. There we go. Hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on. All right. You ought to be seeing Nova Scotia. One more thing. What does that mean? Okay, we're going to start out in the maritime provinces. I'm still hearing feedback. Is that just us or them? It's coming out of the speaker. Let's fix some feedback just a minute. No? That's just no? that sound coming from this Okay, the maritime provinces are in the very eastern part of Canada, and they include these five. Uh, the one we're going to be doing today is Nova Scotia. There's also Prince Edward Island, uh, New Brunswick, Labrador, and Newfoundland. So we did visit on this trip two other of the provinces, but we're not going to talk about them since this one was already way too long. So as we see in the map of Nova Scotia, it is a series of islands. And this darker green is part of the Appalachian mountain range all the way up to Cape Breton Island. So you see a few things about it uh, geographically. Uh, this indented coastline, of course, there are lots of uh, sailing boats and uh, kayaking and whale watching and all kinds of things aquatic along there. The Cape Breton Island is actually a series of several islands separated, but, uh, front, but with a bridge over it. Um, we're going to talk about this lake as we get into it a little bit. Uh, Cape Breton Island is, was where we began. We see out of the visitor center one of the trees that was growing there and sculpted into a woman, which is now branching out, still living apparently. And of course, being summer, full of flowers. This little girl was part of a twosome, two families. The two moms were friends, the two girls, 12 year old girls were friends. And the moms were on one of the game shows and won a trip to Nova Scotia for two. So they came with their two daughters and brought the average age of the uh, population on the caravan tour down quite a bit. And uh, they, the two dads came with the two boys, the two brothers in cars. So we were all staying in the same hotels and the dads and boys did their things during the day while the girls and the moms were with us most of the time. So we had a little look at the Cape Breton uh, uh, Visitor Center and moved on to Chetty Camp, which was our first night in Cape Breton. Chetty Camp is just a small town, as you see along the ocean. Actually, the uh, uh, St. Lawrence Seaways is, is actually what it faces. If you look at a big map, we see it was originally settled by Acad Acadian settlers, which means they were French. And most of the population there is still French. There's an island across from it uh, where they keep their cows in the summertime. So they don't have to build a fence. They just put a gate across here so the cows can't get out. Very, very handy. But it's mostly a fishing town. Uh, here we're on the, the cow island looking out to the mainland. Every, uh, every uh, little place has its lighthouse. And of course, you'll see, we'll see lots of those as we go along. Again, on the island, looking across to Chetty Camp. And down the main street, you see it's not much of a town. It's very cold in the wintertime with winds off that Atlantic Ocean uh, Strait, uh, St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, usually winds up to 100 miles an hour and more. And so uh, there are lots of tow lines that are holding down telephone poles and houses so they don't blow away. But you will see lots of boats also uh, tied up securely. This little lighthouse is not really a lighthouse, but a restaurant made to look like a lighthouse. And we see lots of the lobster pots, this one decorated with the flag of Canada. 
all over the island. This is a pretty little Catholic church here since these were French Canadian Catholics, St. Saint Peter's. We made two stops in Chetty Camp and this was the first one, the uh, rug, the rug museum or the, the Trois uh, Pignon or Tapestry Museum. And we had a guided tour through it. You see one of the rugs right here and some things from older Canada. Now these rugs are hooked rugs as opposed to rugs, rugs made with a loom. So they're rugs that uh, have a piece of wool usually uh, that is inserted in a hole uh, through a canvas backing and pulled out the other side and tied with a loop. So with these, you can make all kinds of pictures uh, here you see it close up how the each each one is a little loop through the backing and some of the some of the uh, rugs in this museum are really beautiful this is one of the largest ones ever made and we'll see more about that it was designed by this lady right here Lillian Burke who designed a lot of the rugs in this museum this was the largest rug ever made, 18 feet by 36 feet. It was made with 200 pounds of wool. And she spent three months just drawing the design on the backing to set this up for the ladies to make it. And this frame then was set up in a barn, uh, which was the only place big enough to make it. And nine women worked 11 hours a day for six months to hook this, this rug. And it was sold to someone in Virginia. They don't know exactly where it is right now. But she designed a number of the rugs that were in this museum, such as this one. And this was for the bicentennial of Chetty Camp from uh, 1785 when it was first settled and made in 1985. Uh, there are pictures. There are pictures of our presidents up to Kennedy, as far as that one went, uh, some historical sites. And also the museum has furniture and artifacts from the homes of earlier days in Chetty Camp the old uh, pump organ. And you see the rugs then would all be these hooked rugs. The other museum that we visited in Chetty Camp is the Mask Museum. And these two people are wearing the masks. So as we, uh, as we went through the museum, we had a number of people who were in masks that were talking to us. Some were on walls, but some were masks that were walking around on people, such as these two people. We got a real good idea of the number of different kinds of masks you can make. And this is kind of a lot of fun. I don't think this is a real person, but this one was. So driving uh, the next day out of Chetty Camp, we spent the night in Chetty Camp and began our travel up the Nova Scotia Cabot Trail. Now the Cabot Trail is this 185 mile loop around the northern part of, the, of Cabot Island, or Cape Breton Island. And it goes through one of the national parks named after John Cabot, who landed in Atlantic Canada in 1497, a long time ago, but probably not here in Cape Breton. He probably took land in Newfoundland, not Cape Breton, but the island was named after him. So this is the Cabot Trail right here, this part of it. And here's Chetty Camp. So we're leaving from here and going up into the Cape Breton Highlands, which is the national park. And there are several things to see up in there. You can see on the big map, it's this part of Nova Scotia. So the road uh, follows the, uh, the sea, not always close to it here. We have a pretty sharp drop off, but most of it's away from the uh, ocean a little bit. And since we weren't there in fall, this took place in August. This was what it looks like in fall the leaves do turn gold and red, and I understand it's beautiful to see in fall. All these beautiful trees then would be uh, colored leaves in fall. But very hilly, very mountainous. We're getting into that Appalachian mountain, about 1,100 feet. And lots of wildflowers in bloom. So we began, uh, began here with our national park um, and entered the French mountain bog, which is at the very top of Cape Breton Island Park. And a bog is, is uh, at, we're now at 1,350 square feet, uh, I mean, feet above sea level. It's this top up here where there's a bog, which is a swampy place. And it seems like an odd place to have a swamp at the top of a highland part. It's, it's actually a fen, which is similar to a bog. And in a bog or a fen grows this sphagnum moss. 
and uh, you may have used it in your garden. If you've been to Ireland, you may know it as peat moss because it, it, it's very spongy and soaks up water. And then as it kind of settles into the ground, it, um, it can be dug up and dried out. And the, the Irish then would use the peat moss for um, uh, fuel in, in uh, fireplaces or furnaces or fireplaces. So the bog looks kind of like this, very swampy area and not to walk on. So there, there are um, wooden uh, walkways all the way through it. This tells a little bit more about it, just some pictures from the, the bog and what's growing there. Not a very long growing season. As I said, it's a long winter, long cold winter, but there are plenty of things, even these tiny little orchids that grow early in the summertime. So we can see little flowers growing as well. And if you hear something that sounds like a rubber band, it's gonna be a frog. And here's the picture of the little frog, if you can see him right there. They make a sound when they croak like little rubber bands and some of the walkways and bogs and flowers. Some grass is the turn different colors in fall. And there are a few animals that live in this area as well, uh, particularly the moose. And we didn't see many moose. We only saw the one from our bus and our driver's on the lookout for them and stop so we could take a picture quite at a distance. But there are a few birds, since there are not many trees in this area, we have very few birds, but there are a few. And we're saving this wilderness for tomorrow for our children who grow up and, and want to see things that are uh, uh, particular to that area. The other stop we made was at the Whale Museum. And there are definitely whales all around Nova Scotia. They called it the Cetacean Nation. You'll notice too that all the signs are in English and in French. So cetaceans are the mammals, the big mammals that we call whales and porpoises, that that kind of thing. They're warm-blooded, young are fully formed, they're covered in skin, and they swim by, by moving these flukes in the back up and down rather than as fish do by moving their fins side to side. So here are the two different kinds. The baleen whales are these on the left and they have the, the teeth in the front that are like um, little combs. They filter out water, they take big gulps of water and then they just they filter what comes in. And so it'd be small, uh, small items like shrimp and krill. And you see the largest is the blue whale. They do have blue whales in this area. Uh, but they can get up to 88 feet long, 150 tons. That is a big hunky whale. And the other type uh, would be the other, the tooth whale. And these include the sperm whale, which would go to 60 feet and 60 tons. tons. And it includes the orcas that we call them killer whales sometimes various kinds of porp porpoise and dolphins. So for, for 200 years, the leading cause of death for large whales was whaling. And of course it was outlawed, um, but still there's still whaling in, in some, for, from some countries and some uh, indigenous people are allowed to catch whales. So up to 22,000 whales have been killed since this law went into effect in the 1930s but whaling has uh, in, increased, or whale, the number of whales has increased. This other thing, I, uh, poster I found interesting, it's Sable Island, which is off of Cape Breton and shows the number of shipwrecks all along here. The graveyard of the Atlantic, it's called. We're gonna see some more about shipwrecks later on. So coming down the east coast then of Cape Breton, very, very wooded and mountainous. And as I said, it would be red, yellow leaves in fall. And our destination was Badek, which is one of the towns along the Cape Breton Highway. And Badek is right here. So we've gone around the loop here in one day. And we're on Lake Bador, which is this, this whole blue area that you see is Lake Bador. And you see there are entrances to the ocean on either end. So this area is actually another island. And while we, we stayed overnight in Badek and we also visit, we visited Lake Bador and also the fort at Louisburg. So we had a little lunch stop. This are some of the houses along Cape Breton and our view out toward the lake or the, yeah, it's gonna be the Lake Bador. The hotels are not the sky rises that we're used to or our hotels, they tend to be more like this, like homes or houses. Uh, this is a country inn, Giselle's country inn. And then they added things that look more like motels uh, as they expanded with tourism. 
but they have little gardens and places to sit outside, very homey. And uh, we can see out some of the beautiful flowers blooming in summertime. And there's a, a boat deck at Bedeck, and uh, we had our sailboat trip on Lake, Bad Lake Broad Broador uh, on this sailing ship. This was taken on the sailing ship. Of course, they put the sails up after we left, so I didn't get a picture of the ship in dock with the sails up. They already took them down be before we docked. So one of the little lighthouses. Uh, this this uh, Lake Brador means Lake of Gold, 62 miles long, 31 miles long. It's very deep near the ocean end of it, uh, 900 feet or so deep. It has this connection to the sea, which means it's tidal. It has, uh, uh, has, has tides come in and out, fresh water from the rivers, but uh, very uh, lots of fish in it. And designated as a Lake Biosphere Reserve by UNESCO. So here we are going out to our sailboat. These are where the sails would be when, when they put them up. And our captain of our ship, a little bit of a sail that I could find. But it was a beautiful day. One, one word about the weather, we were there in August and uh, Nova Scotia is generally pretty rainy. And, and we were there during a heat wave, which meant 80s for them. It was in the 80s uh, or low 80s. And so this was a beautiful day. We had sunshine every day on my trip, about a week of this trip and uh, a couple of days afterwards. And I had one rainy day as I rented a car later. So we had two stops in on our, our stop, uh, our, our trip on the sailing boat. This was at Cape Point. Uh, nothing really to see in that area. There is a little swimming beach, but there's a place where you can tie up boats. There's some hiking trails from that area. And as we were out, we, we, since we had uh, access to the ocean, we did see water, uh, water birds from the ocean and also seals along here. One of the stops, I won't, won't say it's a stop, one of the things that was pointed out to us from the boat was, was this, this big house up on a peninsula of land, which was the home of Alexander Graham Bell. He had this summer home here. Uh, he, this is uh, his family. He married Mabel Hubbard and their two daughters. They also had two sons who died in infancy. And he was an American citizen, but they had this summer home in Canada. And he, uh, Alexander Graham Bell was originally from Scotland. So it had a Scottish name for it, for beautiful mountain. And we see some people here, but they're not tourists. There's that, this house is not open to the public for tourism. They, the Bells own this entire peninsula. So some of their children and their relatives own other houses. There are about 14 other houses on this property. Uh, here we are back in Bedeck, a cute little town. We were met by a bagpiper and this was not unusual either for us to be met with bagpipers, some in kilts, some not, because there are also a lot of Scots. And of course the name Nova Scotia means New Scotland. So we have these two ethnic groups, the Acadians and the Scots, mainly populating this uh, island. So this is the Alexander Graham Bell National Historic Site that's in Bedeck, and it is the thing to see there. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell was born in 1847 in Scotland. And uh, he was a, not only invented the telephone, which is what we know him for, but he was a, an inventor of lots of different things, scientist, engineer, as we said, uh, patenting the first practical telephone and co-founder of AT&T. But mainly he was a teacher of the deaf and because his mother was partially deaf, his wife was deaf, his, his wife's father owned, owned the school where he was a teacher. <clears throat> and the Bells loved, the, loved Canada. When they came from Nova Scotia, they spent a year in Canada first and then came to Boston and then New York. So he was a teacher of the deaf. There's a, a postage stamp named for him. And his invention of the telephone uh, was in 1876. He got the first patent. His rival uh, applied for a patent two hours after he did <laughs> for the same invention. So he's credited with the invention, though it was also invented by someone else at the same time. Uh, in 1877, he got the patent, and by eight, in this next nine years, more than 150,000 people in the U.S. got telephones. So we knew a good thing when we saw it. But, but we don't know a lot about his other inventions. At the same time, the Wright brothers were working on their 
biplane, he was also working on a biplane. And this was called the silver dart, a picture of it in wintertime. And all, in all, he had 18 patents granted in his name alone and 12 he shared with collaborators for, for things we might not have realized he was working on too. The phonograph, the, which the original was a, a circular um, disc kind of thing. Oops, I didn't mean to do that, excuse me. Different kinds of vehicles, including the hydrofoil, uh, an audiometer to detect hearing problems, a metal jacket to assist breathing. Uh, this one I thought was interesting, a metal field on a record, which is the basis for our recorders and hard floppy hard disks on computers and floppy disk drives. So he was the first one who got uh, started, uh, in, started looking at how we could build computers. Uh, early air conditioning, composting toilet, <laughs> A photo phone, which would be the precursor of our cell phones or um, phones where we could see, th see each other. Metal detectors, various kinds of boats, research on hereditary. So when we think of Alexander Graham Bell, he was extremely prolific in a lot of different fields, always working on something new. So this is the view from the, the Bell Museum, a very, very interesting place to visit. The Louis Bill, the Louisburg fort was a French fort and and it, this is a layout of it. The picture you saw would be looking at this right here. You're looking through this area right here. There's also another bastion that has cannons mounted on it down at the far end of it. It included a whole village. There was a fishing village here originally and the French built the fort and various other farms and, and uh, community here. And here we see a, a picture of it. <clears throat> it's a national historic site of Canada. <clears throat> built between 1720 and 1740. So by the 1740s, there was this, this extensive fortress here, actually two fortresses, but the British besieged it in 1745 and captured it, but they had to return it. Uh, and then it was captured again in 1758. And the second time they captured it, they leveled this fort to the ground. So what you're seeing now is a partial reconstruction on the original stone foundations. They found all the plans for the fort, the original plans and built it just like it was back in the 1700s. So the idea is to have a, a, a living history museum that's representative of what French life was like in the 1700s. And so the people there are dressed in their native dress of that era uh, they have a, a summer camp for children, a week long camp where the children can come and live in these homes that don't have electricity or running water or indoor bathrooms <laughs> and have to cook their food over open fires. And they see what that's like to live in, in 1700s. <coughs> Sounds like a fun thing to do. Uh, there's also, they, they fire the cannon off at noon and they have the fife and drum corps playing. I do have a little video of it but it takes so long to get the cannon geared up that I lost interest in the video. And I hear people waiting for this all to start. So here they are getting this ready to, uh, to fire up. So I'm gonna play a little bit of this video, but I did not have the patience. Oh, it's not gonna show, I didn't load it, I'm sorry. I forgot I needed to load the video on it this too. So you didn't miss a whole lot. But the Fife and Drum Corps played and then the uh, cannon eventually did go off. So going around the Louisburg fort, um, you'll see that it's a, they have real working farms, animals, hay, they're growing crops and so forth. And in the homes, they look like they did then. And this lady showed us around this particular home and here she's making lace with all these little bobbins that, that intersect all this to make lace. You see part of the lace already made here. This little chapel is right at the entrance to the Louisburg Fort, which of course the officers and, and people stationed there could use as a chapel. And here are some of the stone walls that were left, but uh, they, they've not rebuilt all of the, the town, just only some of it. So coming back on our way to, back to Halifax, we stopped at the Indian Museum at Truro, which is the Mi'kwak Indians who lived in this area. And in Halifax, uh, we saw the Blue Nose sailing ship. Sailing is sailing, competitive sailing is very big in Halifax, lots of sailing ships. The Blue Nose was one of the winners in one of the Canadian, big Canadian races. And so you'll see the Blue Nose name on a lot of things. 
My sister and I, my third sister was not able to come. She had an emergency and had to cancel at the last minute. We look very glum in that picture. I'm not sure why. Uh, this is when we were in Prince Edward Island, at least we're smiling in that one. So this is an idea of what the Halifax shoreline looks like or the downtown area. We were in the Marriott, right in the downtown area on this caravan tour. Uh, and you see different things along the, the waterfront, lots of restaurants and boats tied up and several museums. So we'll look at that. Back over here is where the, the, narrow, the narrows, it's called the narrows where the river uh, narrows and the industrial part of Halifax is back here where they have their commercial shipping. <laughs> This right here, these streets are going up upward onto a hill. And this high hill was where one of the forts, one of the five forts protecting Halifax was. So this is the Marriott. We're going along the boardwalk along the uh, ocean. One of the cow ice cream shops. They're all over Canada. If you want good ice cream, you can't miss with a cow ice cream cone. And of course there are musicians and as I say, lots of outdoor places to eat, various uh, folks doing different things, uh, all kinds of artwork, a statue of Samuel Cunard, who of course was the founder of the Cunard line. And sailing ships eventually became steamships in the 1840, and he was the one who had the first sailing, uh, first steamship crossing the Atlantic and uh, was the founder of the Cunard line. And then there, there are statues like this made out of bicycles. Halifax along the river, these were former barracks that are now shops and uh, condos or apartments, I'm not sure which above. And we see different kinds of sailing vessels and um, all, well, everything from kayaks to motorboats along the harbor. <clears throat> and of course, seafood, if you can buy seafood along here and the live lobster. One of the museums along here is the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. And outside of it is the Sea Dome. It's a, an IMAX theater. We saw an interesting whaling um, whale show in here. And a second Blue Nose. This is the Blue Nose 2 sailing ship parked outside, you see, of the Maritime Museum. This is the entrance to it. As you come in, <clears throat> you're going to see an old pirate hanging here. Uh, pirate's fate was not very good. If you happen to be a pirate in those days um, and got caught, uh, you not only were hanged, but your body was left to dis disintegrate. Not, not a nice thing. I, I can't imagine taking kids to this, Can you imagine? coming in this entrance and these kids seeing this, they'll be traumatized for life. So the first thing you see when you come in is one of the big lights for the lighthouses. And of course, there are hundreds of lighthouses. On the second story is some of the Cunard line, Cunard line. And of course, the, the uh, museum has lots of sailing ships. This is like the first intercom went up to the Cunard offices on the second floor. My sister is doing a hello up there and a live parrot even. So this is what happens. We are talking about what happens when there are all these shipwrecks. So if you think you're gonna find a shipwreck and find some interesting things, this is usually what happens. The ship uh, periodically disintegrates since the waves uh, beat it up and make it into driftwood. And uh, so most shipwrecks are not full ships there anymore. Uh, some of the things you might find on ships, lots of ropes and baskets and things like that. It's also the, the Halifax is also the home of the Can uh, Canadian Navy. The Brador was the fastest warship in the world in the Second World War. And I'm going to show you two pictures in the next slide of Halifax, one in 1857, the other in 2009, showing you how Halifax has changed over the years. Here is this uh, citadel fortress up at the top of the hill. You see that it is uh, hilly and how it is now. That fortress is over here. And you can see this, this area now is the, the area where we were walking along the um, shore with all the restaurants. So this is the narrowest part and the bridge now that goes over to the other side of the Halifax River. And a little model of Halifax. And I learned how to do my, my name in Morse code and I have a little certificate to prove it. So there are two things that happened in Halifax that are of interest historically. One was the Halifax explosion. 
which happened December 6th of 1917, the beginning of when Canada and the US came into the First World War. And this happened, here's, here's the area where we were uh, with the shops and the hotels. This is the narrowest area <clears throat> and the area that was affected by this explosion. So what happened was that the Mont Blanc was a French ship loaded with explosives that uh, was, was filled with explosives and it ran into the, uh, a Norwegian ship, the Emo. And uh, since it was carrying explosives, it caught fire and it burned. And all these people were standing around watching this big fire. <laughs> but what they didn't know was, was the, these petrochemicals stored below, uh, when they caught fire, it, it triggered this huge blast and this energy released through the ship uh, at, just went over, as it says, it's like a three kiloton bomb in this busy harbor. So the explosion discharged these gases that formed and hot gas arose above the city and chunks of these, this ship was totally blown apart over this huge area. So, uh, and, and with a dark oil film over it as well. So it flattened two square kilometers of the city and more than 1600 people were killed, 9,000 wounded, over 6,000 left homeless. This gentleman, um, Vincent Coleman, was working on the um, uh, telegraph system and he was told that this ship was on fire and he realized what was happening. So he, uh, instead of running for his life, he telegraphed people who were coming, or the trains that were coming in and rescue ships uh, for the government to say, hold up the trains, uh, the munition ships on fire, goodbye boys. And he was blown up in this explosion. Here's a picture of what that explosion looked like. Everything just completely leveled. This little girl was one of the people standing watching the, the, uh, the fire until she was lifted off her feet, it said, and swept as uh, she was put down in a park half a kilometer away. You think of Dorothy and uh, the Wizard of Oz, she was literally carried off her feet and saw where her, her family house was down below in, in flames. And she went to her aunt's house, which was not, and uh, at first she didn't recognize the blackened figure. When questioned about her parents and five brothers and sisters, Barbara replied, they are all gone. And she was correct. Here's a chunk of metal from the, the, uh, the ship that uh, blew apart. So that was a big thing. Here are some before and after pictures of what Halifax looked like before and after that explosion. Reminds me somewhat of seeing the Ukraine pictures now of you know what what it looked like and, and after uh, got bombed. The other event that Halifax is a part of is the Titanic, which uh, went down not far from Halifax, and we see a picture of it. Uh, the first, second, and third classes in it. The four uh, smokestacks on its maiden voyage from Southampton. Here is a model of it. You see people walking behind it on the other side. So here's Halifax Harbor, and here's the Titanic out in a field of icebergs. And of course, it was hit by an iceberg and sunk. A <clears throat> picture of the fabulous staircase inside of it. And uh, this is an artist's an idea of what that staircase probably looked like as the ship was sinking uh, and the water started flooding in. <clears throat> also pictures of it. So what happened was then the Cunard line came and picked up the people who were survivors. Uh, they, were, they were let know that this was on, on uh, was happening and took the survivors to Boston and you see them uh, e uh, exiting here. And the, and the people who were killed, the bodies were taken to Halifax and they're buried in, a, in the cemetery in Halifax. The other museum to see there uh, is the Canadian Immigration Museum. This is a, a shipping crate of people immigrating to Canada. And we talk about, they took everything but the kitchen sink. Well, these people even took the kitchen sink. You see it right here. And their bikes and a whole bunch of other stuff. So the Immigration Museum is about the Canadians that immigrated as to the US, um, many people did immigrate to Canada. Here's one of the railroad cars, a telegraph office, uh, various things about it. We visited the Citadel, that place up on the, the um, hill that we saw, one of the forts, and uh, saw some things above it. It's a good view of the city from there. 
and it was primary uh, array of, of coastal defenses. So there are five fortifications there. This is the one that we went to. They're connected by subterranean uh, tunnels. And this is the one that we saw. It looks like this in a star shape. These are the other four. And as long as it took to fire that cannon that we saw at Louisburg, I can't imagine uh, for uh, defending yourself with those slow moving cannons. They, did, they didn't fire very quickly. So the, if you've seen pictures of, of Nova Scotia, you probably saw a picture of Peggy's Cove, probably debatable, but probably the most photogenic place in, in Nova Scotia. At least that's where they take people and tell us. So you're gonna see some pictures of Peggy's Cove a little town of about 35 people with a lighthouse and this huge, huge restaurant to uh, service the 50 buses at a time that come, tour buses that come in to uh, look at beautiful Peggy's Cove. So lots of photography in this area. You can see that the tide has gone down a little bit, but not all the way out, which is perfect. A lot of uh, on, clear, on clear days or not very windy days, you have these nice reflections in the water and definitely a photographer's paradise. This fellow is uh, this little statue uh, holding two of the codfish. And you see a bunch of lobster pots out here as well, the lighthouse. I was told, this was in 2019 and I was there, I was told that last year, uh, that they have built some walkways along here so you can't walk on across the rocks anymore. Nah, don't like that. And this big restaurant area for, and their tower for uh, feeding the masses of thousands of people that come in. Uh, this was our guide, Lauren Sutherland, uh, one of the Scots who's from Prince Edward Island talking to one of the other tour guides. But just some of the houses in Peggy's Cove, not too many of them. So here is, um, uh, it's not on this picture, just off of here is uh, Halifax and Peggy's Cove. And, and after this trip ended in Halifax with the trip to Peggy's Cove, I rented a car, supposedly with my sister who was not able to come. <laughs> and we were going to visit a friend from Ottawa who lived up here and she broke her leg. So she didn't come. So I thought, well, I'm here. I'm just gonna go anyway by myself. So I had my, a car rented and came up here and stayed one night in Lunenburg, which is a UNESCO World Heritage City, and Mahone Bay. And then the next day went out here to Shelburne, I do have these, and West Pubnico, an Acadian village, Yarmouth. Stayed here and then the next day drove on back through, a, through what's called the Annapolis region, back to Halifax and went home from there. So this part is my on my own part. So from here it is from Halifax and uh, here's where Peggy's Cove is right here. So I got on the highway and came over here to Lunenburg, but you see all of the little inlets and all of the little lighthouses. So if you wanna come along the coast road, it's gonna take you a while. There is an actual highway uh, up to about here. So this is my home bay. Uh, lots of pretty buildings in this town. There are three churches right in a row, and they're interesting in that uh, they're wooden, but the, the siding on it is vertical rather than horizontal. And notice all the lovely little trim on it and colors on it. Very Victorian. And the little uh, houses too. And this is in Lunenburg. Now this is a, a UNESCO World Heritage Town. This is where I stayed, which is the Rum Runners Hotel. It's right on the main street in Lunenburg, uh, built way, way back in probably in the 1800s. But it's been completely redone inside. Very, very nice hotel. Beautiful rooms. You would, would think you're in a Marriott if you were inside. But it's uh, still got its old siding and all like it was in the old days. So it's up from the, the uh, bay a little bit, uh, one story. And you, there is a way to get down there to the street below it. And from the back, this is what it would look like. I was on this floor. And there's another floor, probably 20 rooms maybe and several other hotels. The, the problem with these hotels along the main street is there's no parking. Uh, this, if you were built in the 1800s, there were no, no cars. So um, it's, you have to wait till all the tourists go home to find parking on the street because uh, they can't park there overnight. 
So it's kind of a, a hassle to stay in one of these hotels in the main part of town, but very interesting because it's about six by eight blocks of all these different colored homes built in the 1800s, uh, lots of nautical types of signs, little shops, restaurants, and you see the Blue Nose again, company store, and the Nova Scotia store. And the Nova Scotia store, of course, has all things nautical in it. Lots of seafood, of course, and as I say, all these colored houses, about, uh, I can't remember how many, 800, something like that. A very hilly little town comes up from the ocean, and so most everything is on, uh, on a slant. And some of them have little placards on as to when they were built. This was my only rainy day, very light rain. And you can see some of them, uh, a shipbuilder, um, Baker, 18, uh, 1838, uh, 1868. This guy was a carpenter. Um, so some of them have these. This was theoretically the oldest house. I'm not sure. This is the um, placard on that. Built in 1760, known as the oldest house in Lunenburg. A couple of really beautiful churches. Again, the fancy decorations and color schemes that they have are, are really lovely. So down on the waterfront, right behind my hotel, was the Maritime Museum, or the Fishing Museum, actually. And it was mainly about fishing. Here we see one of the ship bells and a ship um, head, the Fisherman's Museum. Not one of the best museums I've seen, but you know, it's there. Lots of fishing stuff, boats, models of the town, and a blue nose hook rug. And uh, some ideas of how they go fishing. Uh, here are some of the fishing nets. Now, if you thought you were gonna go to Nova Scotia and go lobster fishing yourself, you can just forget about that idea because lobster fishing is very highly regulated so that we don't overfish it. And you have to be in a family that, that have been lobster fishermen forever and there are only certain days that you can go lobster fishing. So if you want lobster, you go to a restaurant because they're the ones who buy these that the fishermen catch. But as far as fishing for lobster yourself, forget that. So in this museum, they do have some uh, old things, uh, a clock, sewing machine, um, typewriter, things like that, and lots of fossils from that area. So the Rum, Rum Runners Hotel got its name because of rum running during the prohibition. And back in uh, Newfoundland, they were making rum. And here is the boundary, the 12 mile boundary. So they could take their sailing ships down to Boston and New York and supply the speakeasies. So my hotel had its name from the Rum Runner Hotel, from actual rum money. So I left Lunenburg on one of the little small roads and you see that the, the fog was still on the water the next day, made some, for some pretty pictures. Went over to Shelburne, a nice little town on the coast, where I got to see this museum right down here was where they make fishing dories. And that was what the fishermen used back in those days, little wooden boats. You can see they're flat bottom. Here they are still building them in this museum to show you how it's done. This lady was building a, a little replica for her grandchildren. You can see the flat bottom in it. And this fellow was a, actually not a live fellow. He was a cardboard cutout. Uh, he was the champion dory builder, apparently. He, did, he built dories every day for 50 years, three a week. And he's a champion dory builder. And this uh, lobster was mounted on a plaque in that museum. And in Shelburne, uh, you see how they cut the trees down. Uh, if they have to cut a tree down, they save what they can and make statues out of what's left. We saw that one out of the Cape Breton Museum too. So that's common. I've seen them in other parts of Canada too, where they do that. Uh, my next stop was in the Acadian village of East Pubnico. You see how the, uh, the, the Acadians were driven out when the French were defeated by the English, they were driven out and either sent back to France. Some were sent to Louisiana, which we know now as the Cajuns, the great derangement, the uh, deportment. And some lived here in the west part of Nova Scotia to, to begin with. They preceded when the, pe the people farther uh, in Cape Breton um, came. So this particular family settled this little peninsula of Pubnico. So you see towns like East Pubnico, 
West Pubnico, Southwest Pubnico, North Pubnico, can we think of any more names? So the great upheaval was the settlement of French public, uh, French Pubnico here in 1604, way before Cape Breton. The England came, they moved them out, they deported them, but these people stayed. So here are some early, early uh, pictures of when they uh, first settled and what the village looked like now. Uh, now it looks like this. I'm sorry, this is when it looked like before. Now it looks like this. And uh, they're, what their national dress would have been looked like. We had a little music in the visitor center. It shows how they built these abatos, which, which were uh, building dikes. And uh, so these are wooden sluices that let the fresh water in, and then they drop a swinging door that uh, drains the water. So in other words, they're draining swampland like they did in the Netherlands. And this fellow, as they were draining swamps, fell this, found this big millstone. And of course, in, just like we have seen all along, lots of sailing ships and things from times past, phonographs, spinning wheels, boots. And if you're a camera collector, they have this huge collection of cameras. And they have a bunch of buildings where people are showing you crafts and things and showing you how they lived back in the olden days. This was a, um, um, what am I trying to say? The blacksmith shop. And uh, here he is making some things, uh, um, making as they would have in those days. Another little place they were drying out codfish and sending it in boxes. Can you imagine what that smelled like after a while? I don't know. Uh, lobster pots. Of course, they had lobster fishermen. There's one of those dories. And the fellow inside was uh, making nets, showing us how that was done. And they're working farms here with animals. They're feeding the cows here. They had some pigs and chickens and so forth, uh, fishing. Uh, doing all the things that they would have done back in those days. A lady in the post office didn't seem real happy to have her picture taken. I don't know why not. Um, but the lady in the, one of these nice little houses, she was full of smiles and showed me around. My grandma had a stove like that back in Wisconsin. Uh, you see the quilts, of course, and the spinning wheels and things from that day. She had a stove like this, too and a washboard and a pump to pump water. An old sewing machine, my mother had one like that. And of course the little lighthouse, there is a little path running up to the Abbott's Harbor Lighthouse. And it was actually moved farther uh, out on the peninsula so the fishermen could see it. A little bit about the lighthouse and here it is uh, on the next morning or some of this fog. So more churches on the way to Yarmouth, very pretty. And Yarmouth is uh, the western part. There, there are ferries that come in here from uh, Bar Harbor and Boston, and I'm not sure what all is running. Some of them quit running during the pandemic. So if you're thinking about taking a, a, a ferry from the mainland of US, you can do that, but I'm not sure I would look at ferry schedules. So it's not a very big town. The, the lighthouse is out here on the peninsula, the Cape Forshu, which means claw. It looks like a little claw on the map. And downtown Yarmouth is not much to look at. We could use a coat of paint on this little store. Uh, but that's really not what you go to see. So here's my hotel, again, looking like a little house. Uh, breakfast is in what would have been the living room, I guess, a little patio in the back. So I arrived about um, sunset coming from uh, Lunenburg and the, the city park is right downtown and uh, it was dusk at that time. Lots of flowers, summer flowers and uh, the sun going down over the harbor. So there are a couple of things to see in Yarmouth though, besides the lighthouse, which I did do. The County Museum is one. Uh, tells you how life was as we were seeing all through Nova Scotia, what life was like. Uh, lots of uh, things from this area. There's a big shipbuilding town and home to many ship captains. So the other big thing we're gonna wanna see in Yarmouth is these Victorian houses that are really lovely. There's some uh, ship uh, lighthouse uh, lamps. 
what, what's always fun for me in, in museums like this is to see a whole room set up like this. Uh, what what uh, life would be like, including all the different rooms in the house and what they dressed like, what they ate for dinner, everything. Loom. These are made of toothpicks or matchsticks. But my main thing was looking at the Victorian houses. So this is one of the little bay windows, very, very popular in these houses. Uh, this is one house looking at it from the front and then from the side with a big porch. And again, you'll see the uh, bay windows and a lot of them and the trim with different colored trim. And the, they're made of wood with the, the siding, horizontal siding usually. This one looks like a church, doesn't it? This is supposed to be the oldest one, a doctor, 1820. And the, the styles of houses, a lot of times they combine styles. For instance, in this one, you might see um, this looks very Gothic and then a very Georgian looking door. So they combine styles a lot. They weren't uh, particular about sticking to one style. But a lot of different, different things. This one I think had five doors in it, outside doors called the Bishop's House. And the Bishop's House uh, had an entrance here in a little turret. And this is around the other side of it. And notice the siding on it and the, the stained glass window in it. There are two other houses again with both with bay windows and fancy uh, color schemes. Little side garden. So they're fun to see, the, the uh, church. And then I went out to the lighthouse, uh, which is called an apple core design. <laughs> Looks like an apple core. And you see that the next morning, the, uh, the fog was still out. So there are hiking trails along this peninsula. And just a few foggy pictures. You can barely see the ocean down here. And then as I left the peninsula, I'm, leave, I'm going by all these fishing boats. Another church, ooh, look at this leaving Yarmouth. So this was my trip just back along the Annapolis Highway. This whole area is uh, agricultural, a lot of orchards. It doesn't go right along the shore. And so the main highway, I did uh, take one of the little uh, roads leading into the shore. In this case, the uh, Harborville uh, tide was out and this is the Bay of Fundy and back here. And the tides in the Bay of Fundy, you may have heard get to uh, 30 feet all the way at the end. So this is what it looks like when the tide's out every couple of days. And then of course, uh, comes back in again. So that's the end of our little journey to um, Nova Scotia. And I hope that you enjoyed it. And if you were hot now, maybe you cooled off a little bit. So I'm gonna get out of that one. Okay, so Stop. I'll that. You want to you want to leave that on? Yeah. Okay, that, okay. and then you can do the stop recording as you want to keep going. I don't know. Do you want the, the discussion? All right. So, anybody uh, online have any questions for Mary?